and welcome. Well, every subject we'll feature in this series is important, but today's is right up there in terms of why we exist as a charity and what we are passionate about. What do we think of when we hear the word research? Anything? Scientists in white coats, sterile labs and microscopes? It happens without us thinking that much about it at all. How, why, and there is a why always, or who pays for it? Research is ultimately about people. People like the 300 families every month who will be told that their child has cancer. That's 10 families a day of young people aged from zero to 24 getting a diagnosis that will change their lives. But groundbreaking research, which except for charity support would otherwise go unfunded, is saving the lives of children like them every day. We fund research into the causes and treatment of childhood cancers, accelerating breakthroughs to improve survival rates and crucially, working to find kinder, more effective treatments with fewer toxic and long-term side effects. Let's find out today about what research actually means, how we choose what projects our funds support, the difference it makes to lives and where it might take us in the future. Our first guest is Ellen and I'm truly thrilled she can join us today to share her story firsthand. Ellen has had an incredibly tough journey, but even though she still faces challenges every single day, she makes it her mission to support others who are going through a similar experience. Ellen, thanks so much for joining me today. Um, can you give us some insight into how your personal experience has shaped your view of research into cancer and its importance? So for me, without research, I wouldn't be here. And I think that's the, that's the real message that I want to give. Without your research, I probably wouldn't be here. The second time that I had cancer, I was able to have a different treatment that was less invasive, less, less kind of side effects and a higher success rate. And that treatment wasn't available the first time that I had cancer. So without research, I wouldn't have been able to have that treatment. And that's why I'm so grateful. That is... That's quite stark, isn't it? That's yeah, it's something to live with. But... And there was only three years difference between the first time I had cancer and the second. So it's amazing how much can be done, you know, in a short, relatively short space of time. And um, remind me how old you were at that point, because did, did even just knowing that there was a new treatment, did that have a... a good psychological impact on you knowing that you had to go through treatment again yes yeah definitely I mean I had to so say this I was 12 to say, so I was nine when I first had cancer and I was 12 when I relapsed and I did have to have um, chemo at the beginning initially just because my the second time around the cancer had been caught quite late but I then went on to this new treatment that as I say was less invasive and had a very high success rate mm. and it, it did it, it you know it, it meant that I was able to do a bit more whilst on treatment, see friends, do a bit more. I, I was in hospital, but I felt better and I didn't feel so unwell. So it was a huge relief to have this new treatment and know that there was, you know, it was a higher success rate and, you know, for the future, really, and hope for the future. Mm, that's fantastic. Um, so tell me a bit about your involvement with us at the charity Children with Cancer UK. And have you found it to be of benefit to build a relationship with us? Yes, definitely. So um, formerly Children with Cancer UK, their offices, your offices were opposite Great Ormond Street. So I always knew that you were there. And if we'd go on like a little walk or I was in my wheelchair, we kind of always spotted your offices. And it was great comfort at that time. But it's only really over the past five years that I've been more involved um, with you, speaking and sharing my story and the impact and you know my late effects and, and how you've helped me. And then it's really over the last couple of years, even more, I've been even more involved with just building that relationship and getting to know a bit more about your research and how, you know, you help, you help people like myself who have, who've had cancer and childhood cancer. And it's, you know, you're just fantastic. And I think it's, you know, it's just a chair. I think when you've been through something like this, it's really tough, but knowing that there are charities like you who are in, you know, doing the research and helping people for the future. Amazing. Thank you for saying that. Um, and you do speak very eloquently and passionately about the late effects of having had childhood cancer. Why, why do you think it's important to raise that awareness? I think it's really important. I think a lot of people have this perception that when you're diagnosed with cancer, 
you have, say, six months of treatment or so, and then you're automatically back to that person that you were. And this is for children, adults, any, you know, anyone who's diagnosed with cancer. And for a lot of us, it isn't the case. You know, we, we are left with these late effects. And they're life-limiting. They're probably going to be with us for the rest of our lives. We don't, you know, with research, we don't know. I don't know how things are going to be in the future for me. Um, but... For me, it's really important to raise my voice and share my experience. You know, I don't want people to sit here and be scared of my story because I've been through a lot. And if, you know, I don't want to worry people who say I just diagnosed, but equally, I, you know, it's my story and it's what I've been through. And I feel that it does need to be shared. Um, late effects can happen to anyone. It's very random. Um, you know, I've, I've been left with multiple late effects and probably more than most. But it does happen, and that's why we need to raise awareness. We need to get to a stage. At the moment, we're getting to a stage where more people are surviving cancer, which is fantastic, and obviously that's what we want. But we don't want their lives to be limited, you know, because of the because of the side effects and the treatment later on. So, you know, as much as we need to be having people survive cancer, we also need people to be, you know, live, living a whole life post-cancer. Mm. And that's why we need additional research so that people hopefully in the future won't be left with all of these late effects. And that's what I try and campaign and share because, you know, we need research and also obviously support for people day to day living with late effects. And of course, um, for children with cancer, that's hopefully a very long post-treatment future. So yes. it is important that that's, that's a life well lived. Well, yes, exactly. Because as I say, I had treatment when I was nine and 12. So I'm going to have, you know, tens of years left and I need to be, you know, living a life where I feel well. And I think, you know, we, we need, to, hopefully for the future, we will have, you know, with research, we'll be able to get to a stage where everyone's really well post-treatment. Well, it's been great to chat to you today and to see you looking so well. I'm really glad you could be here. So thank you so much for talking to us it's today. A pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. Our trustees are a vital part of our organisation and I recently got the chance to speak with one of our newest recruits, Professor Bruce Morland. He's recently retired as a professor of paediatric oncology and among many career achievements, he has extensive experience in the development of new therapies for childhood cancer. Here's our chat where I asked him to demystify the word research to highlight recent developments in the treatment of cancer in the young and also to signpost some key areas which are going to be a focus in the near future. Professor Bruce Mullen, thank you for joining us today. Right, we're going to have to start with the basics. What is research fundamentally and why is it important? Really good question. Big question. It's a big question, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess at its simplest level, research is all about discovering new stuff. Um, is that the scientific it's term? A very, it's a, the technical <laughs> term, stuff, yeah. yeah. And it, 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 it can occur at many, many different levels. I mean, when we talk about research, people often envisage scientists in white lab coats and pipettes and test tubes and all that mm. sort of stuff. Yes, that is research. That's one level of research where we're hopefully finding new discoveries that might tell us something about how a cancer cell works, discovering new drugs, new treatments. It's what we call basic research or laboratory research. But beyond that, there are other levels of research. So a lot of our children also participate in clinical trials. Now that's also research. Yeah. That's asking the question about, is this treatment better than the treatment that we've done before? There are also research that just uses a lot of data. So whenever we see patients, we collect a lot of data about the type of cancer that they have. Where do you live? What's your father's occupation? Epidemiological research. And that's about looking for trends to see whether we can find, find causes of cancer or preventions yeah. related to cancer. But each of these research domains has to have a question. To have good research, you need to have a good question. It's not simply a fishing exercise. Mm. And so research is all about having a good question 
and then scientifically working through to prove with as much certainty as you possibly can that what you think is true is actually true. As um, the CEO of this charity, Children with Cancer UK, one of the challenges I find is helping people to understand why funding research is important. And to, I think a lot of people feel like it's this nebulous thing that doesn't really result in anything. It's too slow. That's the challenge in terms of fundraising yeah. to fund research. What, what would you say to those people? Well, it couldn't be further from the truth. You know, the, the improvements that we've seen in children's cancer are directly related to research at all of those different levels that I just spoke about. Mm. Uh, and so let's give you an example. When I started practicing as a childhood cancer specialist blah, 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 years ago, the cure rate was around about 65, 70%. Mm. Okay, today we'd be looking more like 80, 85%. So even during my relatively short career, in the grand scheme of things, we've nudged yeah, the survival rate elite. up. Yeah. yeah, and I can put a lot of those percentage points directly back to new findings and new research. Mm. And actually, people have done studies where they've shown that patients who have participated in research studies actually do tend to have better outcomes. So we're forever chipping away at those last few percentage points. And research is the way that we drive that message across and we get those improvements in survival. It's all about, well, not all about, but it's mainly about survival, as you know. Yeah. What, to your mind, over the last, I don't know, five, ten years, is that a fair question? Are there some of the exciting <clears throat> developments that, pe that can give people hope? Yeah. Um, well, let me give you a couple of examples. So one of our commonest um, childhood cancers, leukemia. Uh, back in the day, we filled kids up with lots and lots and lots and lots of chemotherapy, mm. different drugs, different cocktails, quite toxic treatment. That's still somewhat true of today, but we've been able to incorporate some newer novel therapies, the therapies that specifically target the leukemia cell. And I think a good example of that is some of the antibody therapies that are now pretty much in routine use in some types of leukemia, which not only has improved those survival rates, but means that we can actually start to tail back some of the more conventional chemotherapy drugs which have very significant side effects. Mm. So it's always that balance about, yes, we're always wanting to chip away and improve survival, but we're also very conscious about the long-term effects of treatment. And an equally important part of it is trying to reduce those side effects of treatment. So that's leukemia. Yeah. I think another example would be one of the solid tumours, which is neuroblastoma. Now, when I first started practising the advanced form of neuroblastoma, which is unfortunately quite common, was pretty much regarded as an incurable disease. These days, we would give people a much better chance of cure, 50% plus Mm. So we've gone from virtually zero to 50% over, say, 20, 30 years. Mm. And again, that's been due to a combination of knowing how to use existing treatments better, adding in new treatments, high-dose therapy treatments, and again, antibody therapy has now become a routine part of that. And so it's a very complex treatment program but we've been able to use all of our clinical trial research to build up knowledge over time, add in new bits of treatment, take some old bits of treatment out. But again, that's resulted in very significant advances in cure rates. It's incredible, isn't it? Now, you are instrumental in the charity in helping us to decide where our 
research money goes. What, to your mind, are some of the really hopeful or, you know, the most important areas to be looking at over the next few years? So there's been a big explosion in what we call molecular medicine over the last 10, 15 years. The uh, ability to uh, look in detail at the DNA that makes up the cancer cell. A lot of cancers are cancers because there are these alterations within the DNA, within the cell. It's extraordinary com extraordinarily complex, um, but we now have the tools and have had the tools for a while to look in detail at some of those changes. Now, those changes perhaps aren't as apparent in children's cancer as they are in adult cancer, but there are still important changes that are there. And research has been ongoing and continues to be funded by the charity to look in more detail at this molecular uh, side of, uh, of the cancer cell. And ultimately, that's really trying to identify new therapies that can target those changes and hopefully switch off the cancer process. Mm. So a lot of our laboratory research is still focusing on the molecular side of things. I think some of the newer therapies that we're likely to see develop over the next few years will relate to how the body's own immune system can be utilized to destroy the cancer cell. I've already talked to you about leukemia and neuroblastoma antibody therapy uh, being in relative routine practice these days. There are some really exciting new developments. I think the COVID uh, pandemic has taught us a lot about vaccines mm. and there's a really interesting area of research around whether or not cancer vaccines can be developed using some of the technologies that we had during COVID. CAR T cells is something that's in the press all the time, really exciting, producing some astounding results, uh, big successes in some types of um, leukemia, less successful for reasons that we're not quite sure about in solid tumours, but there's an opportunity there. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in the immune system and how that might be uh, monopolised. And then the charity also is funding the other end of research. I talked about you know, trying to prevent toxicities yeah. or identify toxicities early and help patients cope with their toxicities. So it's not all about front-loading the geeky science stuff yeah. and finding new treatments. We're very much funding research through the whole patient journey and beyond. Mm. It's fascinating, and now I'm not going to ask you to sugarcoat promises for me but listening to you talk there is so much to be hopeful for there's we've come a long way we've yeah. still got a long way to go but it's looking possible absolutely you know as i say we keep chipping away um we've still got a little way to go there are some tumor types which we still struggle with i mean uh, just taking a broad group of, of tumors some of the brain tumors mm. still are a, a big challenge to us uh, and so they definitely will demand some new therapies that perhaps we don't even know about yet. But I'm optimistic that we will keep chipping away. It's slow and steady, you know, make, making those big advances early on was relatively easy. Chipping away at these last few percentage points is going to be incredibly difficult, but it, we are, we're still doing it, we're still succeeding and the funding that we get for research is helping to drive that agenda. And we will keep... It's, in, it's invaluable. You know. We will keep funding it. Absolutely. Huge thanks to Professor Morland for breaking that down for us. The amazing work being carried out fills us with hope for the future, reminds us that it is making a massive difference and that our grant making to research and related organisations is vital for ensuring that this continues uninterrupted. Christiana Ogenbote works with us at the charity as our head of research and can tell us more about how what we do directly supports and impacts projects which are making a difference to the lives of young people with cancer. Christiana, you're our head of research at the charity and I think a lot of people would be really interested to know what goes into deciding how, which projects get funded? 
I think for us, it's really important that we recognize that we don't work in isolation, but actually that we collaborate with a lot of different people and organizations. So it's important for us to work with the best researchers, the best nurses and teams, along with other organizations that share in our interests and in our strategic vision to help children and young adults who are suffering with cancer. Mm. So we're really, really lucky to have some really great people on board in representing our trustees scientifically, but also we rely on our scientific advisory panel, which is basically a group of specialists who advise on what we fund, how we fund it, and the direction in which we take the research. Mm. That must be, it's an enormous responsibility, and I imagine a lot of pressure to make sure that the money's going where it is most needed. Definitely, particularly because we support such a wide range of children with cancers, we have so many different needs. It's important that we're able to make the right progress for each of those types of cancers according to what's necessary at the time. Mm. And once you've chosen which projects we will fund, how do you then going forward work with those projects and the scientists behind them? It's really important that we follow through with what we fund, especially because we can give a research team money, but making sure that we're seeing the impact of what we fund is really important. So for us, keeping up to date on a regular basis throughout the years of the project, getting in touch and seeing if the teams are making the right steps going forward, being able to celebrate their successes and really cheer for them when things are going in the right direction, which mm. is what we hope and aim for a lot of the time. Yeah. And also really just being able to understand what is being done with what we're funding. Now, obviously um, at our charity, we hear a, a lot of frightening and sad stories. Do you have some hopeful information to give us about the work we're doing in research. What are some of the projects that you're excited about at the moment? I think we have a lot of exciting things in the pipeline research-wise. I think particularly as we understand that the treatments that children and young people get when they have cancer can actually have really hard implications for them in the long term. So we're funding a lot of research that helps to mitigate or actually take into account some of those side effects that kids get from the therapies that they receive. So for example, we're currently funding a research in Edinburgh with Professor Rod Mitchell, who's looking at how we preserve tissue from children to help them have opportunities to have families of their own. Mm. Because we're finding a lot of the time that the treatments that we give to children actually affect their ability to have families as it affects their fertility rates and so being able to store and freeze that tissue before they have treatment gives them the opportunity in the future to be able to decide on families of their own one day. What would you say to uh, people who are considering donating to us and helping us to invest in research? What, what's something that you think everybody needs to know about childhood cancer research? I think it's so unique in that we really are funding the future. Children have the capacity to do so much and have such a long life ahead of them and making sure that they're able to have the best quality of life really makes the difference. So what you fund now truly does help the next generation have the best opportunities out there. Thanks so much, Christiana. Thank you. Thank you to Christiana for that. We'll be talking to her again later in the series. Next up is Sharon Elliott, mum to Harry, who was diagnosed at the age of just four years old. Sharon has supported him through more than a decade of different treatments, hospitals and research programs, and continues to do so. But she's also determined to continue encouraging Harry as he proves time and again, and in spite of challenging side effects from treatment, that he is so much more than his diagnosis, as are all of the young people we exist to help. Sharon is a passionate advocate of the importance of research in relation to cancer in children, and I'm thrilled to welcome her here today. Sharon, thank you for being here today. Tell me, how have breakthroughs in research impacted the treatments that Harry has received since his diagnosis? When Harry was first diagnosed in 2011, um, I'd never heard of his diagnosis before, um, it was something completely alien to me and we were told after his first couple of bouts of chemotherapy that he was, he qualified for proton beam radiation and back then we were only the second family that our um, cancer treating centre had referred 
for proton beam radiation because at that time there were no proton centres in the UK for mm. children. And that meant that as a family we travelled to America for three months um, to undertake proton. His treatment protocol at the time of diagnosis was a mere six months. Um, although I thought that was amazingly long when I first heard it, when I then speak to other parents whose treatment protocols for other forms of cancers were considerably greater than that. Mm. I'm very, very grateful for the six months that, that we had to go through. I'm led to believe now, due to research, that the protocol for Harry's form of cancer is now about 18 months. It's the six months of the active treatment that he had, but now young people will have a year of maintenance chemotherapy, which mm. is something Harry didn't have, but is something that's come about through research as to what is now deemed the best protocol to have. Mm -mm. We wouldn't have known that without having had research. It must have been frightening, and, and Harry and you all must have been brave to take that leap of faith and, and try that new technique. Does, and, you know, as you say, that's had later life effects, but does Harry feel somewhat proud of being a bit of a pioneer? Um, I don't know. What he... Look, when we've been approached in the past to um, to help with Child, with Child Cancer Awareness Month in the month of September, both Harry and I have been up to London on a few occasions where uh, he has talked through his journey. We've done some, some, some videos as well. And what he wants to show is the resilience yeah. that, you know, despite having cancer, this is what you are still able to achieve. And that, yeah, it's frightening, it's scary, you don't have a clue. And I think also it depends on... I do think that there's a, there's a difference of how old a young person is when they're diagnosed. Mm. Um, and, you know, Harry was four, so there was no particular questioning of, no, I'm not going to do this, why do you want me to do this, whatever. If, if Harry was older... Um, it might have been completely different. Um, and, uh, he knows that he is how he is because of some of his treatments. Mm. He knows that he has to take medications because of the side effects of the treatments that he had to keep him alive. Um, and he knows he has to keep on taking those medications. But I'm not sure if he would know that if he didn't have the treatment that he wouldn't be alive. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I have said to him in more recent years, you know, we were sent to America to have our treatment because there weren't the centres in, in the UK, but there are now. Yeah. And he went, well, that's really good, Mum. It's not good that they're having to be there because children's cancer is still around. Uh, and no parent ever wants to hear those four words, mm. your child has cancer. And both Harry and I are are so focused on being able to help the research journey to if we can ever get to the point where no parent ever has to hear those words if your child has cancer. That's what we all want so badly. Mm -hmm. I think that for a lot of people who haven't been on the journey that you have, I think the importance of research into childhood cancers is quite hard to understand. Mm. Um, but you feel very strongly about it, don't you? Oh, very much so, yeah. I mean... When you look at the amount, the number of different childhood cancers that are in and around at the moment, um, I'm part of a much wider Facebook group that, ha that supports um, parents of children who've had cancer. I did a straw poll a few years back um, and asked, them, asked the parents of, uh, you know, what type of cancer did your child have and created a list of all these different cancers. I had, there were over 200. And some of these... Well, a lot of them I had never heard of. I'd never heard of Harry's diagnosis when it was given. I had to get them to write it down. I knew of leukaemia. Um, and over the years, leukaemia is one of the few cancers that has had a lot of research put into it, which has then sort of dropped those um, uh, death rates down. Yeah. Um, but there are so many that haven't had that research put into it. As a family, we're part of a research protocol that's run by Children Cancer UK, specifically for the type of cancer that Harry has. 
Um, we've been part of that now seven, eight years, mm. something like that. We're also part of a long-term side effect research protocol that was put together um, by the Proton team in America for us to go to Great Ormond Street for a number of different investigations and scans and track progress. And it was through those um, scans and interventions we found out some of the long-term side effects. We obviously, 12 years ago when Harry had his treatment, it was very new. Yeah. We were only the second family to have gone there from the Marsden. Um, they couldn't tell us what those long-term side effects were, which is why being part of that research panel meant that we were being tracked and be able to track those changes. And it was through that we found, because of where Harry had his proton, um, there was a reduced development around his skull. He has no top jaw for his teeth. Wait, so he, his teeth are basically hanging into his gum. There are no roots at all on his top jaw. And that came about from, from the, the scans and investigations we had. And we now know that that is a long-term side effect of proton beam radiation that the proton teams can then share with families. Mm -hmm. When we had proton, they couldn't share with us very much because of how new the treatment was. It is so important that organisations were able can fund specific childhood cancers, not from a generic fund that you only get maybe two, possibly four percent of a donation that goes specifically to children's cancers. You know, some, some of the young people are on treatments that haven't been looked at or adjusted for 40 years. Mm. The, the, they're on really old medications that haven't been looked into to see if there's another kinder alternative that's less invasive. And I know that specific research around Harry's cancer has led to the treatment protocol changing. And we had six months um, that included both proton and chemotherapy. And I believe now it's another year on top of that for maintenance chemo. That information wouldn't have come about without research. Mm. And without families like yours mm. willing to to go with it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. It's incredible. Now, uh, tell me <coughs> what then you've think is the significance of charities that are childhood cancer specific, like Children with Cancer UK? They're targeted, they're dedicated, um, they're coming from the same area that we as parents of children with cancer want wider organisations to come from. When you're part of a generic pond, you, don't, you, you, you get drops, you know, we need the waterfall, you know, we need everything pushed and dedicated to try and eradicate those four words that parents hate to hear. Mm. They don't want to hear your child has cancer. We want that phrase to be eradicated from every medical profession's dictionary. And that's not going to happen without research. Uh, it will take time and it will take money but it is time and money well spent. And there has been progress. There has and been. There, and there yeah. will be more. And mm. one day, this charity won't need to exist. Absolutely. That's our mission. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thanks for sharing your story with us today. Thank you, Jo. Hearing personal lived experience is so powerful, isn't it? For me, it makes the connection between research and people. It's not some generic term that's cold and sterile, it's real life. It makes a difference and it is constantly changing. Knowing that there are so many childhood cancers with no treatment yet, as well as damaging side effects, which researchers are trying to prevent, and hearing firsthand what patients have to go through for even some semblance of normal life, makes me more determined than ever. Determined to keep fighting for them so that fewer and fewer children have to lose their childhoods to debilitating treatment, isolation and trauma. So we'll keep sharing our young people's stories. We'll keep lobbying for more recognition of the issues around cancer in the young and we'll keep raising the crucial funds without which progress would not be possible. The research community is making such exciting strides forward and it is an honour for us as a charity to be a small part of that, but there is so much more still to do. I hope you feel the same. Please click the link in the description below to find out more about how you can support us in our work so we can look forward to more breakthroughs on the journey to eradicating cancer in children once and for all. Next time, we'll be sharing stories of hope ambition and inspiration which prove beyond a doubt and to quote Harry's mum Sharon again 
that these wonderful young people are far more than a diagnosis.